All right, so in this video, we will study minima and maxima of continuous functions. So let me start with two examples. My first function is x cubed minus 3x squared plus 1, and I'm looking at the function over some closed interval between minus 1 half and 4. Now, what is the maximum of the function over this interval? Well, the highest value that the function takes is actually at the end point here, where the value of the function is something like 70. So that should be the maximum of the function over this interval, right? And the lowest or smallest value that it takes is somewhere like here. In fact, it's at x equals to 2, I think. So that should be the minimum of the function. But there's also something kind of interesting occurring here. This is clearly not the highest value of the function over the interval. But if you look at points near this point, there's a little bump here. So locally, it's kind of the highest uh, or, or some sort of maximum locally. But it's not the highest value of the whole thing. OK, so let's look at a second example which is the absolute value function over some closed interval between minus 5 and 5. Now, what is the highest value uh, or the maximum of this function? Well, we see that at both endpoints here, the value of the function is 5, which is the highest value. And the lowest value of the function is going to be at 0. OK, so let me now define these terms mathematically. So what do we really mean mathematically by maximum and minimum? So let's choose a point, C, in uh, your interval A and B. Then we say that f of C is the absolute maximum of the function over this closed interval if f of c is greater or equal than f of x for all x uh, in a and b uh, in, the, uh, in the closed interval. And similarly, we say that is the absolute minimum if it's less or equal than f of x for all x on this interval. So looking back on my examples here, I see that this is an absolute min. In this case, and this is an absolute max. In the other case, well, these were absolute max, and this one here was my absolute minimum. But we can also define something called local maximum and local minimum. So what is this? So we say that f of c is a local maximum if f of x of, of the function f of x, if f of c is greater or equal to f of x, but only for the x near c. And similarly, we can define the local minimum if f of c is less or equal than f of x, but only for x near c. What do we mean by x near c? What we mean, that's a rigorous notion in mathematics, we mean for some open set containing c. So in particular, we cannot have a local maximum or minimum at some endpoints of the closed interval, because the endpoints cannot be in an open set, because it's the endpoint. All right, so if I look back at my example, this, this is exactly what this point is. This is a local max. Because if I, I can choose some open set, say something like that, where for any x on this open set, the value of the function at this point will be greater or equal than the value functions at any point over this open set. So that means that locally it looks like a max, but it's not necessarily a max over the whole interval. Okay, so that's cool. These are just definitions. Now, uh, there's a very important theorem, which is called the extreme value theorem, which says something which is pretty obvious, again. So what it says is that if your function is continuous over some closed interval between a and b, then f must have an absolute maximum and an absolute minimum at some points, c and t, in this interval. Well, that is kind of obvious, right? So if your function is defined as continuous over the interval, well, it could be constant, in which case it would be its own max and min everywhere. If it's not constant, then it'll kind of you know, move around, and then there'll be some point where it attains a maximum value and some point where it attains a minimum value. So that's, again, pretty obvious. The proof, however, is not straightforward, so I'm not going to present that, uh, but the statement is easy to understand. So if you look at the examples we had, well, this is pretty clear. I mean, there's an absolute max here, absolute min here, over this closed interval. Uh, there's always going to be an absolute min and an absolute max. Now, the continuity requirement here, again, is very important. So let's just look at a simple example. Take the function 1 over x uh, over the closed interval 0 to 5. Well, there is no absolute max for this function over this interval, right? Because the function keeps increasing and increasing when your x goes towards 0. So there's actually no maximum here. But that's fine. It doesn't contradict the theorem because 1 over x is not continuous over this, com this interval because the limit, the right-sided limit as s goes to 0, blows up to infinity. So in fact, 1 over, over x is not even defined at x equals to 0. So that's fine. This is not uh, satisfying the assumptions of the theorem here. 
Okay, so now the question is, how can we find maxima and minima functions? So let's see. So the first thing we can ask is where can extrema actually occur? Right, so let's look at our two examples. Well, the first place where it can occur was the case of the absolute max for both functions. These were the endpoints of the interval. So maximum, uh, maxima, extrema in general can occur at the endpoints of the interval. Now, if you look at the first function, there was always there was also a minimum here, an absolute minimum here, and a local max here. So what is special about these points? Well, the fact that there's this little bump actually means that the tangent lines here are horizontal, right? And saying that the tangent lines are horizontal means that the derivative of the function at this point is exactly equal to zero. So that's another thing, another place where extrema can occur is wherever uh, the derivative of the function at the point is equal to zero. And there's a third place that where they can occur, which was the case here. So this is not a point where the derivative is zero, because in fact the derivative is not even well defined. That's a corner. Right? So extrema can also occur at corner or kinks, which is where the derivative does not exist. So we end up with three cases. Extrema can occur either at the endpoints of some interval, or at point C where the derivative is zero, or at point C where the derivative does not exist. Now the two last cases together have a name. These are called critical numbers of a function. So critical numbers are wherever either the derivative is zero or the derivative does not exist. And what we can conclude from our little analysis, so we just look at two examples, where you can convince yourself that as long as you assume that the function is continuous, these are the only possible cases. So what we can conclude is that if f has a local extremum at a certain point c, then c must be a critical number of f. So it must be such that either the derivative is zero or it's a corner of the function. Recall that local uh, extrema cannot occur at endpoints by definition of the local extrema. All right, so that's kind of cool. Now, one thing you should note as well is that the converse of this statement is not true. If c is a critical number of f, that does not imply that it's a local extrema. So an example, if I look at the cubic function x cubed, that looks like something like this. And at 0, well, the tangent line here will be horizontal. right? So this is my function, so f prime of x is equal to 3x squared, so definitely f prime of 0 is 0. So this point here is a critical point, but it is not a maximum, a local maximum, nor a local minimum. So this is an example which says that critical number does not imply that it's a local extrema. extrema. Oops. Okay, so we always have to keep that in mind. But if it is a local extrema, then it's either such that it's horizontal line, the tangent line is horizontal, or it is a corner or a kink where the derivative does not exist. So with all of this, we now have a method for finding the absolute extrema of a continuous function over some closed interval. It's pretty simple. It's a three-step method, and it will always work as long as your function is continuous. So you first find the values of f at the critical numbers, so critical numbers, remember, is wherever the derivative vanishes or it does not exist. So you find all the values of f at these critical numbers over the open interval. Then you also find the values of f at the endpoints. And now you know that the largest of these values will be the absolute maximum and the, the smallest will be the absolute minimum. This is because of the extreme value theorem that tells you that there must be an absolute max and an absolute min. And from our analysis of the previous slides, where we saw that these absolute max and min must occur either at endpoints of the interval or at critical numbers of f. Okay, so let me end this video with a, uh, the example that we've studied so far. So the function x cubed minus 3x squared plus 1. So we'll just do the step-by-step -step analysis to find the absolute max and min over the interval minus 1 half to 4. First thing I want to do is find the critical points. So what are the critical points here? Well, first, f of x is not only continuous, it's actually differentiable over the interval. So I will not have any points where the function, uh, the derivative does not exist. But I'll definitely have points where the derivative is 0. Derivative here will be 3x squared minus 6x. So this is 3 times x times x minus 2. 
So f prime is zero. Sorry, what did I write there? f prime of zero is equal to zero, and f prime of two is equal to zero. So there's two critical points. There's a point here, which is a critical point, and a point here, which are critical points. Okay, that makes sense. Now, first thing is to find the values at these critical points, now, or, or critical numbers. So we see that these two critical points do correspond to local min and max. So we can find the value of the function at these points. f of 0 here will be just equal to 1. And f of 2, if I'm not mistaken, will be equal to, well, let's just calculate it. So 8 minus 12 plus 1, which is equal to minus 3. All right, so that's the first step. The second step is to check what the value, calculate what the value of the function is at the endpoints of the interval. So here at minus one half, you can calculate it and I think you'll get something like one over eight. And at the other endpoint of your interval, which is four, you get something much bigger, 17. And then you just compare all these values, find the highest, the largest one and the smallest one, and these will give you the absolute max and min. So we can conclude, so that's the third step, absolute max is uh, 17 at x equals to 4, and the absolute min in this case is the smallest value, which will be minus 3 at x equals to 2. Does that make sense? Well, indeed, that's exactly what we have, x equals to 2, this point here, 2 minus 3 is the absolute min, and the absolute max will be at 417. All right, so that's what, that was an example of how to use uh, the extreme value theorem and uh, our analysis of uh, maxima to, uh, and minima to find the absolute extrema of a continuous function over some closed interval.